All right. So backward induction. So perhaps this is the easiest way to solve sequential games and it is by backward induction. Now backward induction works. How does backward induction work? So let us work with the help of an example to how to do backward induction. So let's start with battle of the sexes game in which the wife plays first. So the wife chooses ballet or boxing after which the husband chooses ballet or boxing. So the payoffs are going to be both of them go to ballet, it's going to be 2, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0. And if both of them go to boxing, it's going to be 1, 1. So how do I work with backward reduction? So if the game were to come to this decision node, let's see. What would be the best response of the husband at this decision point. What would the husband choose at this decision node? See, game theory works if you think yourself as rational agents in their shoes, if you were to make a decision at this point, what would you choose? Kanishka, please switch on your mic. So could you please repeat the question? I have- a Yeah, if you, were at, if you were at this decision node at place of, what should the husband do at this decision node? Should he pick ballet or should he pick boxing? The ballet. Why? Because it gives a one payoff. Very which good. Is more so he should zero. pick ballet. Very good. So he should pick ballet. So I can just eliminate whatever is not being chosen. So I know that if this decision node is reached, then the final outcome is going to be two comma one. So what I can write is I can write two comma one here directly. I can remove this entire sequence which follows that. Similarly, if this decision node is reached, what would the husband pick? Boxing. 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 Yeah, exactly. So, so I know that the husband will pick boxing here. So, because two is higher than one. So I can just eliminate everything and just write that if you come here, the outcome is going to be two comma one. So now the wife knows this. That if she picks ballet, the husband would eventually pick ballet and two comma one is going to be the outcome. If she picks boxing, the husband will eventually pick boxing and one, uh, sorry, not two comma one comma two. One comma two is going to be the payoffs. So in this setting now, what should the wife do? What would be the best response of the wife? Ballet. Ballet, because she knows that by picking ballet, she gets two. By picking boxing, she gets one. So ballet is the best response of the wife. Okay. So the best response is that, let me build everything again. The best response is the wife picking ballet. Uh, the wife picking ballet here, then the husband picking ballet. And here what happens is we've seen that the husband picks boxing. So if I call this as decision node two, this as decision node three, this as decision node one, then the Nash equilibrium strategy is going to be ballet comma ballet boxing, which is basically the SPNE result which we got in the previous 
It's when we drew the entire matrix and solved for the SPN. So backward induction gives the subgame perfect Nash equation. Okay. So let's do another example, the centipede game that we did. So in centipede game, we saw that if player one plays Player one plays right, he gets 10, player two gets zero. If he plays left, then player two chooses. If he picks right, he gets 20, player one gets zero. If he picks left, then player one again chooses. If he picks right, sorry, if he picks right, he gets 40, other player gets zero. And if he picks L, then both players get 30, comma. Now the aim is to solve using backward induction. <clears throat> so when I solve using backward induction, start from the last decision node, okay? So in this case, you would either start from this decision node or this decision node. In any sequence of nodes, always start with the penultimate decision. So in this case, what would player one pick? This is left or right. So what should player one pick here, left or right? Right. Right, because right gives him 40. Okay. So what should player two do here? So now player two knows that if he picks left, it becomes 40 comma zero. So you can as well write 40 comma zero here. So he knows that if he picks L, the payoffs are going to be 40 comma zero. If he picks right, the payoffs are going to be zero comma three. So what will player two do now? Right. Right, because 20 is greater than zero. Remember the second number corresponds to player two's payoff always. So he is going to pick right. So now player one knows that at this decision node, okay, at this decision node, if he goes left, this is going to be the outcome, zero comma 20. So he knows that by picking right, he gets 10, zero. By going left, he gets zero, 20. So then obviously right is going to be the chosen choice because 10 is greater than zero. So this is your backward induction strategy, right, right, right. Okay, so the backward induction strategy is going to be right, right, comma, right. Where this right, right represents right played by player one here and right played by player one here. So if I were to write this as R1, R2, R3, if this is R1, R2, and R3, the Nash equilibrium is written as R1, R3, comma, R2. Okay, so we club the strategies of player one together and then okay <clears throat> which is basically the subgame perfect Nash equilibrium so obviously if the question asks you what is going to be the Nash equilibrium of this game you have to draw a two cross four matrix right you will have to draw uh, this two cross four matrix LR LL RL, RR, LR. You have to draw this matrix and search for Nash equilibrium using those that star mark technique that we have been using. And if they ask you subgame perfect Nash, then you can just use backward induction because it's very time efficient using backward induction. You don't have to draw this entire matrix. So there are going to be two kinds of questions which they can ask you from the same thing. They can ask you the Nash equilibrium, and they can ask you the subgame perfect Nash equilibrium. So for Nash equilibrium, use this. For subgame perfect Nash, you can use this. Okay. All right. So and there's this theorem which I will not prove obviously that all subgame perfect Nash will have a, a backward induction will be the outcomes of backward induction, okay? 
So backward induction will give all subgame perfect Nash equilibria. Okay, if you ask me if there are games with multiple subgame perfect Nash, yes, there are. But at your level, I don't think they'll ever give you any question which has more than one subgame perfect Nash. So if you are very devoid of time, let's say it's the last final minute and you see that there's this question, time is going to run out. So you can just mark if there is any question on subgame perfect Nash, it always has unique SPNE. That's the answer. Okay, it will always have unique SPNE because at your syllabus, at your level, multiple SPNE is not going to be asked. That's going to be way more complicated to handle. Okay, so at your level, they are never going to ask you multiple SPNE. So all the questions that you are going to get will have unique SPNE. When you do past years, you'll realize what I'm saying is true that all the questions which have come have always had a unique experience. Okay, so if you just don't want to solve it, you don't have time, let's say, you can just mark unique SPNE and move on. All right. Okay. <clears throat> all right. Now let's apply backward induction for continuum of strategies. So assume that in the herder example studied earlier, instead of moving simultaneously, herder one chooses first his number of sheet followed by herder two, find the Nash equilibrium in this case. Okay, so now remember the herder problem, price was equal to 120 minus Q1 plus Q. So now we are saying that uh, herder one, chooses Q1, then herder two observes Q1. This is important step. This thing is that herder one knows what Q1 is and then herder two chooses Q2. Okay, so that's the chronology of things. Herder one choosing Q1, herder two observing Q2, herder two choosing Q2. So in this case, we are going to apply backward induction. So start with, so if I look at the sequence of game, so herder one is going to choose Q1, which can be a continuum between zero to infinite, any real number quantity. And then herder two observes this and then chooses Q2. which is going to be between zero and But the crucial step is this one, that when herder two makes his choice of Q2, he knows what Q1 is. So you can write the profit function of herder two. So profit function of herder two is going to be uh, 120 minus Q1 plus Q2. This is the price into Q1. No, sorry, into this is sir, it should be word. H2 observes Q1, right? Yeah, sorry, Q1. Thanks. So, uh, so now I want to look at what will be the best response of herder two. So best response of herder two is obtained by del pi two pi del q two equals to zero, which will be what? What would be this equation? Give me q two in terms of q one. Yeah,
Come on, is anybody solving this? Okay, you ask you. What do you have? Sir, Q1 plus 1, one bit, uh, Q1 plus 120 upon 2. So Q2 equals to 120 plus Q1 by 2. Yes. Is this correct? Others? Just a second. Sorry, sir, it will be 120 minus Q1 upon 2. Sorry. Okay, I said correct. What about others? Are you doing this? Are you sitting with a notebook or not? Yes, sir, I'm getting the same. All right, fine. Okay, so this is 120 minus Q1 by 2. This is absolutely the same thing we did in last class. And maybe you guys should need to revise more often because this is something we did last class, right? So this should not have taken so much time. Anyway, uh, coming back. So this is the best response of agent one. Now, agent two knows that for whatever Q1 he picks, this is the amount of Q2, which is going to be played. So now what happens is that Q1 knows that Q2 is going to play this amount. Q2 is going to be this one. So, so I heard her one knows that Q2 is going to be this one. So when I write profit function of herder one, which is 120 minus Q1 plus Q2 by, uh, sorry, Q1 plus Q2 into Q1, I can just substitute this value of Q2. So this is 120 minus Q1 minus 120 minus Q1 by two whole into Q1, right? So this is 120 minus Q1 minus 120 minus Q1 by two. So that is 120 minus Q1 by two into Q1. So this is profit of hurdle one, which is now a single variable function. So all I need to do is del pi one by del Q1 equals to zero, which will give me Q1 equals to what? Solve it basically. That's what I did. Solve this. So 60. Good. 60. Are others there or should I wait more? Yes, sir. Okay. So, so yeah, so Q1 star is 60. Substitute it back into this equation. So what do you get Q2? What is Q2? Come on, through. What is Q2? 
the substitute the 60 here yes 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 60 uh, 30 yeah 30 120 minus 60 by 2 is 30 okay anyway so now you have q1 star equals to 60 and q2 star equals to 30 So, uh, yeah. So now I want to compare this with uh, the previous case of simultaneous movement. So this was sequential, movement. but just before that, the price in this case is going to be uh, 120 minus Q1 plus Q2. So that is going to be 30. So price is 30, profit is just revenue. So profit of firm one is 60 into 30. So that's 1800. And profit of firm two is going to be 30 into 30. Yeah, this 30 into this 30. So that's going to be equal to 900. So these are going to be the values. Now remember, so this is for the sequential case. For the simultaneous case, I used to have Q1 equals to Q2 equals to 40, which gave me price equals to 120 minus 40 plus 40, which was equal to 40, which gave me pi 1 equal to pi 2 equals to price into quantity. So that is 16. So everything is absolutely uh, changed now. Now that firm one is moving first, it it gains an upper hand in that it, uh, it gains a higher market share as well as gains higher profit. But this is overall for the consumers, is it good or bad? Simultaneous is... Uh... Think about it first, then start speaking. Is it better for the consumer? Which is better for the consumer? Sequential or simultaneous? So sequential because they have to pay less price. Exactly. It's very simple. It's very objective for consumers. See, you're a consumer. All you care about is prices. Okay. In a free market, you don't have to worry about prices and quantities simultaneously because lower prices automatically implies larger quantities in a, in a competitive, in a free market without any government interference, any quantity controls, whatever. So lower prices automatically means higher total quantity and all you care about is lower prices. So this is better for the consumer. So you can get questions like this. Okay, like what is better for the consumers? So basically you have to find out what's going to be the market price and then report that. And there's no other parameter better than prices to compare it. Okay, so price lower means consumers are better off. Uh, okay, so this was the herder example. Now, graphically, what, what has changed? So this graphical interpretation is very interesting. So initially, we had the equilibrium as the best intersection of best responses of the two agents. So this was the best response of one of the agents. Change. And this was the best response of the other region. Okay, so let's say this is best response of agent. Uh, this is Q1, this is Q2. So when Q1 is zero, Q2 120. This was best response of one. 
best response of agent two is q two equals to one twenty minus q one by two. So when q one is zero, q two is one twenty. So this is best response of agent two. Yeah. So this is best response of agent two, which is q two equals to one twenty minus q one by two. Right. When q one is zero, q two is one twenty, and when q one is no, so put that at the end. This is best response of agent one. This is best response of agent two, which is Q2 equals to 120 minus Q1 by okay. When Q1 is zero, Q2 should be equal to 60 according to this equation. And at Q1 equals to 120, Q2 becomes zero. So this is the best response of agent two. Now, uh, This was the equilibrium 40 comma 40 in the case of sequential games. Now what's happening in simultaneous games is the best response of agent two is as it is the same line that we have here. The other thing is the second thing that we use is maximizing profit of agent one. So what we are going to draw is isoquants of order one. Okay. So isoquants of order one uh, so they are going to look like this. Uh, the isoquants of order one And it's going to be tangent at this point. The lower isoquants are better. Okay, the I, lower the isoquant, the better. So this is going to be the highest quantity. This is going to be Q1 equals to 60. Sorry, highest isoquant, which is highest profit. Q1 equals to 60, Q2 equals to 0. This is basically when herder 1 is a monopoly. So if herder two decides to quit, then the best response of herder one is to play the monopoly thing. So when he is the monopoly, he gets the highest payoff. So this point is the highest profit. And profit reduces as you move away from this point. So this is let's say highest profit pi naught. So this is going to be let's say pi one. Then this is going to be let's say pi two and so on so that it is increasing towards the x-axis. It is increasing downwards. So you want the herder wants to be on the highest isoform possible. Right, he wants to be on the highest isoform possible. But he knows that the final equilibrium will be along this yellow region because along best response of herder two because ultimately after he picks the herder second herder is going to respond. So he wants to pick a quantity which is on the lowest possible isoform. So these are the different isoforms. So obviously he is going to pick the lowest isoform which is going to be the point of tangency. So this point which is our equilibrium 60 comma 30 this is the tangency point of herder one's isoquant and at to herder two's best response curve. Okay, because the tangency point gives the lowest possible equilibrium. Any point below it is not going to be touched. Any isoquant below it will not have any intersection with the green line. 
right? He wants to be on the green line. He has to be on the green line. Harder one has to pick a point on the green line because if he does not, suppose he says, okay, I want to pick this point. Suppose he decides, okay, I'll produce 60. So what will happen is Herder 2 will produce this much. He will not be choosing, like, okay, you're producing 60, so I'll choose zero. Herder 2 will pick a point on his ISO point. Herder 2 cares about his best response. So the final point of production will always be along the green point. Right, so it will be along this green curve. So, so now that herder one knows that the final point is going to be along the green curve, he can anticipate and he can choose to pick a point such a way that he gets the lowest possible ISO point. All right, so remember this difference that sequential, the outcome of sequential is uh, intersection of best response curves of both the agent, whereas simultaneous is tangency of her first movers isoquant and second movers best response. All right, uh, repeated games, I'll come back to it later. I mean, this is an additional topic I teach, but it's not in syllabus, I just teach it. So maybe let me complete the things that are in the syllabus first, and then I can come back to these topics. Okay, so Bayesian, Nash, and uh, simultaneous game. So if I am able to complete everything, I'll come back to it today. So my aim is to wrap up game theory today. So I want to see how much I can complete it and then I'll come back to it. So let me do auctions first. So this is, let's see, because auctions is asked much more often. Those game, those things are not even in the syllabus. So let us do auctions first. And then if time allows, we'll do as much as we can of these additional topics. Okay, auctions. So there are a number of auctions possible. The four most widely used one are English auction, Dutch auction, first price secret, second price secret. Now what is English auction? English auction is a standard auction procedure. You put something on the table that you want to sell and you invite bids. Then people keep on going up and up on their bids. And eventually when nobody is going to outbid someone that someone wins that particular price and he pays whatever he has. Made. So that's English auction. Okay. All right. So in English auction, suppose there are two agents who are bidding for some particular good G. So for agent one, the good G holds a value of 40 rupees. For agent two, the good G holds a value of 60 rupees. So they start from zero and they keep going up by one rupees each. One, two, three, four, five, six, and so on. So what is going to be the selling price of this good? Final selling price of this good? 60. Okay, any other answer? the highest bit rate. Yeah, I, I got your answer. Uh, I'm looking for if somebody else has a different opinion. We don't have to look at the numbers. We should look at the strategies of players. Let me give you easier numbers. One and three. Or rather four and six. Four and six. Okay, the way the bid proceeds is Let's say agent one says one rupees. Then agent two will say, agent one says one rupee. Agent two will say two rupees. Then this guy will say three rupees. This guy will say four rupees. After that, what will happen? Dhruv, I'm asking to you. After this, agent two will, it will be sold to agent two for rupees four. Okay. 
So now coming back, what is going to be the selling price? So this 40 and 60 is the price that you have written, right? I am saying 40 is the maximum agent one is willing to pay. 60 okay. is the maximum agent two is willing to pay. So okay. now what will be the selling price? That it can be okay. anything above 40. So you are saying it can be, let's say agent two bids 40. Then it can go above 40. That's what you're telling me. Yes, it can go above 40. It can, if the agent, why? Wins, because agent two has the capacity to go up to 60. So he can bid for 41, 42, 43, any price. So he will optimize it by bidding at 41. Okay. All right. So, all right. So what you're saying is probably when agent one knows agent two's, uh, agent two's this thing. Uh, what agent two is willing to pay for this and he is going to outbid this guy. This is something which jealous agents do. Okay, we don't assume this in model. If you are a person who is jealous of the other guy, you will do this. Okay, so 40 me ki phiri dega, tumko 60 tak jaane ko ready, I'll outbid you. Okay, this is not something we assume in the model. Our agents are non-jealous models. They are rational agents. They only care about what their utility is. So if this guy buys it, the utility of any agent I is basically his valuation. This is the valuation for the good V1. This is the valuation for this good V1. So any agent's valuation, uh, price, sorry, the utility of agent I who wins the good VI minus PI. This is the price he pays. This is his valuation. If he wins, if he wins, or zero if he loses. All right. So if this guy is going to lose, he doesn't care if this guy buys it at 60 or this guy buys it at 40. So that's why beyond 40, this agent is unwilling to. Even if he knows that agent two's payoff uh, valuation or so and so, but in this case, we actually I should have mentioned this. In this case, agents don't know each other's valuations. They are unaware of each other's valuations. So you don't know, suppose you go above 40, suppose the bidding reaches 40 here, 39, then this guy bids 40, then this guy bids 41, let's say. Now, you don't know, agent one does not know what is the valuation, this valuation is hidden from him. If he bids 42, and let's say this valuation was 41, he has a risk of actually winning the bid and then his valuation becomes if agent one purchases this good at 42 rupees if this bid wins then his utility will be his valuation 40 minus 42 which is negative you're buying something at a price higher than your valuation okay so what this guy does is he stops when the bidding goes above his bandage. Okay, so he will stop when the bidding goes above his valuation. So the final price is going to be 40 or 41, depending on who bids 40 rupees first. If agent two bids 40 first, it will stop at 40. If agent one bids 40 first, it will go to 41 and then it will stop. We don't confuse this. We always say that the final bid value is going to be 40. Okay, so we say that the final bid value is going to be 40. Now, uh, sir, I have a doubt. Yeah. How can it be 40, for example, if agent 
uh, one says 40 in the end so agent two can counter right so the valuation yeah that's what i said that's why i said it we assume we don't okay. complicate things for that we say that you because you are beginning with the assumption that the raise has to be you are starting with the assumption that the bid has to go up by one rupee i'm saying that it can go by any amount so this guy can bid 40 point 10 10 to power minus 10 anything higher it's a real number right so it yes, can go yes. up it doesn't need to go up by one rupee so that's why we don't confuse it much further we say that the final bid is going to be 40 rupees uh so this final bid amount is going to be 40 rupees now suppose we have three agents agent one has a valuation of 40 Agent 2 has a valuation of 50 and Agent 3 has a valuation of 60. What is going to be the final price? Think in your mind how the bid will proceed. So 50. 50. Very good, 50. Okay, so it's the second highest valuation which becomes the price in this case. So the second highest valuation actually becomes the uh, winning bid. So in English auction, the winning bid is going to be the second highest valuation. Okay, so that's the Nash equilibrium, actually. That is the Nash equilibrium. The Nash equilibrium is, it's a sequential game. It's a sequential game in which people see their strategies. People don't see each other's valuation. These valuations are private information. So valuations are private income. So you know your valuations, you don't know other guys' valuation, but you know their strategies because they are bidding in an open arena. Like you see bidding for, I don't know if you have ever seen bidding for IPL, how bidding for players in IPL happens. They are all called in a five-star hotel. There are uh, the officials are on the stage and there are eight tables or eight teams and then they display a player then everybody just bids so it's interesting uh, <clears throat> so yeah so the second highest the final price will be always the second highest valuation Now let's look at Dutch auction. So the seller begins by offering the item at a relatively high price. If no potential buyer agrees to that price, the seller reduces the price by fixed amount. The first buyer who accepts an offer price can buy the item at that price. In this case, equilibrium bid is the valuation of the bidder with the highest valuation. Okay. So, in Dutch auction, what we say is that suppose the valuations okay, so starting from zero, the guy starts at a very high price for this good. So, suppose he's selling some artifact which he knows that nobody will pay $10,000 for. I mean, you will be a fool or maybe you would be like you you have your own bank to print money or something like that so somebody knows that they are selling a pen and nobody will buy it for 10 000, more than 10 000. okay so this auctioneer is unaware of what would be the valuations of the people so what he does is he starts from 10 000 he says 10 000 lena chata hai kya? Nobody agrees, then he reduces it to let's say nine 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 nine, then reduces it further, and so on it goes. Suppose the valuations are V1, V2, V3. Okay. So he starts at a very high price. So again, you have utility of agent I is equals to valuation minus price if he wins. and zero if he loses. 
so in this case we say that the we say that the final bid is going to be the highest bid we say that this is going to be the case but in reality that's not true in reality what happens is that if you exactly purchase it at b4 if this guy exactly purchases at b4 then utility of agent 4 is going to be v4 minus b4 which is zero so winning it at your valuation is going to be uh basically winning it at your valuation is like losing it altogether so you let it fall you let the price fall for a little bit and then you bid for it now where you bid is going to be dependent on this guy's expectations about what v3 what the next guy's valuations are now because v4 does not know what v3 is he will not wait as soon as price goes slightly below uh v4 he is going to say yes i'll want to buy So it's going to be slightly lower than B4, but we cannot comment how much lower. So we say that the equilibrium is B4. So that's the assumption we make that we don't know how much he'll wait. He'll wait for one paisa, one rupee, ten thousand rupees, one lakh rupees, depending on what's the magnitude and all this. But in reality, this rarely happens because you actually wait for some sizable amount of price to fall in this case. So there's a lot of confusion with. this kind of a case so this is mostly uh not very popular anymore okay because there's a lot of confusion it depends on what b4 knows about the other guys if he thinks that he is the only one who wants it he can wait it for the price to fall sufficiently if he thinks that the other guy may say yes at any point of time he would say it as soon as the price falls below b4 okay there also Two people have the same valuation, then there can be a problem in the duct. No, there is no problem as such. The problem is that yeah, that's what I'm saying. So when two people have same valuations, the person who says first gets it. If two people say yes simultaneously, the bidder allots it to any one of them with half probability. Okay, so if both of them are at the same valuation, by the way, so that's a good doubt. If two people are on the same valuation, let's say, then they let's say they both raise hands at b4 for whatever reason even if they don't have same valuation let's say they same raise hand at same price so then the bidder will randomly allot it to any one okay so that rules of auction can change what happens is then actually they start with dutch and when you have two people if you have two people who raise hand simultaneously then you start going up again Okay, then you say that okay, ठीक है अगर दस हजार पे तो let's say five thousand पे two of them say yes we want to buy it then he'll start going up again okay five thousand one पे कोई खरीदना चाहता है five thousand two पे कोई खरीदना चाहता है and as soon as one of them lowers their hand the other guy wins okay. so this auction theory is basically a very wide syllabus a lot of people work at it work on it uh, that how how should things be auctioned and in different places different type of strategies work. so when you are auctioning uh contracts for building roads versus auctioning natural resources like coal mines so what thing works where it's a very uh a very rich literature a very nice uh, topic actually anyway coming back in this case we assume that the final equilibrium price is going to be the valuation of the highest bid okay so if for the same valuations if you go for the english auction the bidder gets b3 and if you go for the uh, dutch auction you get b4 so if the aim is to maximize the payoff of uh, the auctioneer the auctioneer is a person who selling the product so if the aim is to maximize the payoff of the auctioneer it's best to go with that okay. but you see the problem with dutch auction is that 
people have this anticipation that prices can get lower even in the first even like it can keep falling mm-hmm. so there's a nice paper in which they some scandinavian nation it applied dutch auctions to theater seats you see weekend seats are in huge demand so what they said is that uh, we are going to start with high price suppose you are selling the tickets for a sunday so there is saturday friday thursday wednesday tuesday monday so on monday we start with the high price for a sunday ticket so let's say prices start at 1000 bucks then on tuesday they are going to come down at 900 let's say not 900 they they say that uh, uh as time proceeds but yeah you can assume 900 800 and so on. no wait no sorry uh i got confused this was in the model yeah the model was as yeah as uh, yeah as more and more people buy it dynamic pricing basically dynamic pricing so it was a matter of demand and supply so if if uh, let's say nobody buys it on monday the prices will fall right but if people buy it more on tuesday then the prices would rise on rise on tuesday so that's something which they tried so the idea was basically as you get closer if more and more seats are sold so people who plan ahead should get a benefit like it happens in airline tickets okay you see for airline tickets if you plan ahead you get them for cheap but if you keep waiting it rises but on the final day on the last day let's say you look for flight prices today you'll actually feel that it is lower because now that the final stock which is remaining its airlines will try to uh, sell it off so this is something which happened that uh, people would keep waiting even if they had valuations higher than let's say 1000 they would not pay 1000 rupees they because they anticipate that as you reach a saturday the prices would fall okay so so this is what could happen with with dutch auctions that if v4 doesn't speak up v3 doesn't know that he is the highest second highest bidder and not the highest bidder so if nobody speaks up prices keep on falling and let's say prices keep on falling from here they cross v4 v4 doesn't bid it crosses v3 v3 also gets jealous, uh, gets a little greedy okay let it fall further i'll get a higher utility because utility is the difference between uh, your valuation and the price you pay so they don't speak up at all so it can lead to actually if v2 also doesn't speak up v1 also doesn't speak up you can actually get a price which is very low okay so if others expect that the prices can still fall nobody else is going to speak up you may actually end up in a situation where prices are too low so that's why dutch auctions are very uh susceptible to low prices also depends on what expectations are so it will really depend on what the expectations of the bidders are about other valuations so that's dutch auction but for sake of convenience we are going to assume that the equilibrium bid is valuation of the highest bid. so equilibrium bid is valuation of the highest bid. yeah the next is first price sealed bid so then we come to sealed bid so these are uh, the first two are categories of open bids like if i make a bid everybody else knows it these are categories of closed bids so in first price sealed bids what happens is all bids are made simultaneously in sealed envelopes and the winning bid is the individual who has submitted the highest bid so the price paid the price paid by the winning bidder will vary depending on the rules of the auction so we assume that the sales price is equal to the highest bid so suppose you say that everybody write it on a piece of chit and mail it to me 
or just email it to me, whatever your bids are. On a given day, I will open all the bids and I'll see who has bid the highest. The person who has bid the highest gets the particular commodity. So in this case, what happens is again, utility is your valuation minus the price if you win. And it is equals to zero if you lose. So now what happens is suppose the valuations look like this. Again, valuations are private information. Suppose the valuations are 0, 20, 30, 40, 50, and 60. Suppose these are the valuations. So now these people don't know each other's valuations. So what will they bid? So if somebody is like, yeah, mujhe rupai profit hai. So everybody is going to bid 5 rupees lower than their base price. If you assume that is going to be the case. All right. So the idea is that the final bid is going to be won by this uh, the person with the highest valuation and the price is going to be the bid amount is going to be closer to his valuation. He's going to reduce a fixed amount from his valuation. What that fixed amount is, it will depend on circumstances. All right, suppose he is sure that if he gets the bid, then uh, suppose he just wants to be the owner of this commodity. He doesn't care about uh, uh, anything else. He just wants to be the owner. Okay, so in that case, he's going to bid very close. Suppose you're bidding for, let's say, an IPL team. So you have, let's say, the banks have allowed you 1,000 crores. So all you care about is winning this team because you want to be a team owner. Okay, that's the next cool thing you can do now. So you have 1,000 crores, you'll bid, bid at that 1,000 crores. You'll bid your valuation completely. Okay. So in this case, what happens is firms bid equivalent or slightly lower than their valuations. So we say that the final bid amount price is going to be the val maximum valuation. That is what we assume in equilibrium. But again, it's not really certain that what is going to be the strategies. What are going to be the strategies? So will the strategy of any agent I, that is the bid of any agent I, will be equal to his valuation or some valuation minus some epsilon. And if there is some reduction in epsilon, what it's going to be this a little bit of a uh, lack of clarity. So this is something where uh, only game theory cannot give you the answer. You have to get deeper. It gets on a case-to-case -case basis. For example, you're bidding for, let's say, a captive gold mine, for example. Okay, so for example, suppose you have a power plant. So suppose, what are captive coal mines? Captive coal mines are power plants or uh, blast for uh, iron, iron and steel plants. They are given the option to bid for coal mines. And then they cannot sell this coal in the open market. They can only use it in their blast furnaces for iron and steel mines, or they can use it for production of electricity if they are a power plant. So suppose there are different power plants who are bidding for a captive coal mine. So power plant one, let's say power plant one, without the captive coal mine, it has a coal expenditure of, its expenditure on coal per year is let's say 20. For second power plant expenditure on coal is 50. For third power plant expenditure on coal is let's say 60 and so on. All right, so in this case, they are likely to get a little greedy because if they paid something lower than their valuation, their uh, cost here, suppose they get this guy, suppose this guy actually gets it for let's say 55. 
so he makes a profit of 5 rupees because that's a reduction in his cost so then firms have an incentive to go a little lower than what their valuations are for this particular group so you have to get on to a case to case basis and then it becomes complicated you have to get into data and see all those stuff so that's first price sale bid but remember that we assume that the bids of every agent are going to be equal to its valuation and the final price is going to be the highest valuation that is what we assume for first price sale bid now finally second price sale bid second price sale bid similar to first price auction only that the bidder need only pay the amount equal to second highest bid so in this case the valuation of the ith bidder is is basically so you know utility of ith bidder utility of ith bidder is going to be v Two V two is the second highest bid minus oh sorry V one minus V V one minus V two V two is the second highest bid V I minus V two V two is the second highest bid if I wins and zero if I loses V two is second highest bid not the bid of the second person because I F person doesn't know what the ordering is so let me call it We, we can write it as a superscript because I'm using subscripts for agents. So superscript represents the second highest valuation. Okay. So what happens here is the Nash equilibrium is V I V I equals to V I for all I. in this case agents have no incentive to bid any other amount irrespective of what kind of a situation you are in you will have no incentive to bid anything else so what happening is that initially when you, countries used to get uh bids for uh, uh let's say construction of roads construction of dams and so on they used to go with first price sale option in equilibrium it is said that price of uh first price sealed auction is equals to v1 the highest valuation whereas price of the second price bid is going, second price sealed auction is going to be v2 which is going to be less than v1 less than or equal to v1 so second price bid uh, sealed bid brings in lower revenues for the auction year but what they realized is in first price seal bid there was a lot of confusion it was not very conducive to a good environment for bidding because now what happens is a lot of it depends on what are the bids of other people so big companies with good network with politicians and bureaucrats they would try to get information about what are the bids of other guys so suppose i if i ask the three of you to bid for a road okay suppose the government asks the four of us to bid for some road construction now if i were to find out what all of you have bid okay so then i can slightly change my bid so that i become the winner that will give me the highest payoff so what i'll do is i'll start bribing the officials who are making this i'll say okay it's a sealed bid you open the bid and bas bata do ki kitna hai valuation then i'll drop in a bid which will be slightly lower than whatever the lowest guy has bid or slightly higher the highest guy depending on what the nature of the bid usually in construction projects it's the lowest bid which they which wins right so because 
the government wants to get the construction done in the lowest possible price. So first price seal bid leads to a lot of confusion also. A lot of times in this competition, what happens is that firms who want to win the project, they just end up pay, uh, bidding their complete valuation. So suppose there's some dam which I want to construct. It's poised to be, let's say, the biggest dam of the world. Okay, so suppose government launches a project for the biggest dam of the world. Now, if I am a construction company, I want to be a part of the project because if I can construct the biggest dam of the world, it will bring me a lot of projects in the future. So suppose I anticipate my cost for this product is 10,000 10, crores. So I'm going to build 10,000 crores. I don't want to make a loss, but at the same time, I want to win this desperately. So I'll say I'll bid 10,000 crores, a complete amount at the end. Then there are some cost runs, cost, uh, uh, cost increases. What happens is that the project gets stalled. There are a lot of issues. Uh, so what would happen is with first price seal auction, one is obviously corruption. The other is companies overbidding to win it. And then ultimately, uh, they, the project gets delayed because the companies in their hit, in their, uh, excitement to win some project ends up quoting a price low, a low price, and then they are unable to keep up the construction at pace. So because of these problems, what happened is that in recent years, India especially has moved to second price seal bid auction especially when it comes to construction of uh, some major highways, railways, such things, we have moved to second price seal bid auction, at least wherein we can ensure that there's a sizable number of people who are competing. So for very technical kind of things like bullet trains, metro, we don't invite bits from a lot of players because not everybody has the technical expertise to do it. But as far as it's something very simple as constructing a road or just laying down railway tracks, so these are things that you can find tens of different companies to be able to do. So in those cases, the idea is very simple. Let, let people do second price seal bid because then the differential between the quotes will not be too high. The first and second quote are likely to be very close. So the government doesn't stand to lose a lot. And at the same time, the companies don't have to be confused. So the strategy for every player I is bid equals to his valuation. And this is the Nash equilibrium. This is a true Nash equilibrium as in no player has an incentive to be. Now, why doesn't any player have an incentive to be? So suppose player one bids his own valuation. And suppose VI is equals to V1. That is, it is the highest bid. Okay. Then the utility of agent I becomes VI, that is V1 minus V2. He gets a utility equal to his valuation, but he Play, pays a, util, a price equal to the second highest value. Okay. And let's say utility, and when valuation is not the highest, then his utility is zero. Okay. So what are the type of deviations which can happen? So in this case, let's call it case one, when he is the highest bidder. He doesn't know he is the highest bidder, by the way. He doesn't know he's the highest bidder. So I have to assume that he doesn't have any incentive to deviate in either of the cases. So when he is the highest bidder, when he has the highest valuation, sorry, when he has the highest valuation, I'm saying that he has no incentive to deviate. Okay, so what happens if he bids a higher amount than V1? Suppose V1 is 100. Suppose his valuation is 100. I'm assuming that he doesn't know, but 100 is the highest value. And let's say V2 is 80. 
So his utility right now is 20. What happens if he bids a higher amount than a day? What happens if his bid amount is higher than 100? What will happen to his utility? Remember, utility is valuation minus second highest bid. If the bid amount of this agent goes to 110, let's say, what happens to his utility? It will increase. Why will it increase? 110 minus 80, which will give him 30. What is 110? Which variable is, is 110? V1. V, V for valor or B for bat? V, V, valor. Okay. V cannot be increased. You cannot increase your valuation. Okay, the bid. Okay, okay, okay. You cannot increase your valuation for something. Okay, just because you bid higher doesn't mean your valuation will increase. Okay. And then lower valuation. utility. Utility, huh? will, utility will decrease. Why will it decrease? Yeah, because you can get the same at a lower bid. What is the amount that you're paying for the win for the product? 100. Why 100? What is 100? Which variable is 100? V1. I mean, uh, the bid that I have given is 100. Bid is 100. And what is the price that you pay? Price that I pay is 80. Sorry, sorry. So I'm if, confused. Wait, wait, wait. Just so if you bid higher, you why will you pay higher? No, utility will increase. Why will it increase? This is the utility. For it to increase, either VI should go up or V2 should go down. So why, what is changing if you increase your bid? Nothing, sir. Actually, it will remain the same. Exactly. It will remain the same. Why does everything have to keep increasing or decreasing all the time? Why can't things be constant? In your head, you are like, if you change, to I to to Okay. It's not that every time something changes, the final result has to change. Things can remain constant. All right. So his, even if he increases the bid, his valuation does not go up. So his utility does not go up because VI is constant. V2 is other guy's valuation, other guy's bid. Actually, this should be V2, not V2, but V2. But I'm assuming Nash equilibrium is V2 equals to V2. So that's why I'm writing it. Anyway, uh, what I'm saying is the other guy's bid or his valuation is out of your control. You can't control it. So when you change your bid, if you're winning, you will still win. But the problem with increasing bid can happen here. Suppose your valuation is 100. You actually bid an amount 110. Okay. So this is VI not equals to, suppose you were V2. Suppose you were second highest bid at 110, but you bid an amount 105. Okay. So what I'm saying is that this is your valuation V1, which was 100. You bid an amount V1, which is equal to 110. So your valuation is V2, second highest bid. The highest bid is 105. The highest bid is actually 105. Now, had you bid your valuation, which was 100, okay, had you bid your valuation, which was 100, you would have got utility equals to zero because you would have lost it. But because you bid 110, you win it at 110, but you have to pay 105. So your utility 
becomes equal to minus five. You buy it at hundred and five for something you value at hundred, so your utility becomes minus five. So when you are not the highest bidder, the only way you can win it is by bidding something higher than your valuation, and then if you win, you might end up paying more, more than you value it at. So in that case, it doesn't make sense for you to bid higher than your valuation. So increasing makes no change here, but increasing bid can reduce your utility if you happen to be, let's say, breaching beyond the first or the highest bid. If you are, if you bid by an amount which is higher than the highest bid, which you don't know by the way what it is. If it is one rupee higher, two rupee higher, five rupee higher, you don't know. So why take the risk? Because there's a positive probability that you might end up with a negative utility. And there is absolutely nothing to gain by bidding higher. Okay. <clears throat> On the other hand, if you go lower, when you're not the highest bid, Okay, when you're not the highest bid, I don't care what bid you are. Suppose BI is not equal to B1. When you're not the highest bid. So suppose the bids are, let's say 100. So the valuations are 100, 90, 80, and this is where you are, 60. This is your valuation, 60. There are a bunch of other people. Okay. Now, when you are not the highest bidder, even if you reduce your bid, it doesn't make difference. You'll never win it. You'll keep losing it. Your utility remains. So you have no incentive to deviate here. But here, when you are the highest bidder, so suppose you are this 100 guy. And if you reduce below 90, you were winning it at 100. Now you lose it. You're, you were winning it at 100, getting a utility of 10 rupees. You unnecessarily reduce your bid amount. You don't win the product. Right? You don't win it and ultimately your utility is zero. So from a positive utility point, you go to a negative, uh, to a zero utility. Okay? So basically, when your utility, when your valuation is the highest valuation B1, in that case, if you increase the bid, you have no change in utility. But when you reduce the bid, your utility may increase, reduce. And on the other hand, when your valuation is not equal to the highest bid in that case if you reduce the you reduce your bid reduce bi then your utility is does not change no change because you were losing you'll keep losing but if you increase bi you may get negative utility So in any of these cases, in any of the possible deviations, you can never increase your utility. Your utility in no circumstance is increasing. So that's why there is no incentive to deviate ever. So that's why you will keep sticking with this strategy. So as long as you stick with this strategy, nobody else wants to deviate. So that's an action. Okay. It is not a unique Nash equilibrium, by the way. Let me give you an example of some other Nash equilibrium as well here. So suppose on a real number line, the bids amounts are 10, 20, 30, 40. Sorry, the valuations are 10, 20, 30, 40. So one Nash equilibrium I observed is B1 equals to 10, B2 equals to 20, B3 equals to 30, B4 equals to 40. 
So this is a Nash equilibrium. Everybody bidding their value. Okay. There is another Nash equilibrium here, which is let's say B4 becomes 50. So the fourth guy, he bids rupees 50 instead of 40. So here again, nobody has an incentive to deviate. Why? Because this guy is winning it. B4 is winning it. What is going to be the price of the final commodity? 30. 30. Very good. Okay. Second highest seal bid. All right. So uh, you pay only 30 rupees. Okay. So price is 30. Okay. Now, if any of them go to a lower bid, nothing changes. Even if B4 goes to a lower bid, nothing changes. He'll keep winning it. Okay. If B4 goes to a very low bid, like this, he'll lose it. He was winning it, he'll lose it. So by going lower, nobody has an incentive to be now let's analyze going above. So when these guy, this guy goes above, he'll still win it. He'll still play pay price 30, nothing changes. But when these guys go above, if they possibly breach the bid of the highest bidder, they might have to buy it. Suppose B3 bids actually 65. Let's say. This price is 50, okay? So in this case, what would be the price? Suppose B3 instead of 30, he bid 65. B4 is bidding 50. Other people are bidding their value. 50 so what will is be the price? 50. 50. Very good. So it's going to be 50. So now B3, who has a valuation of 30, is paying 50 rupees. So he's going to get a negative utility. Any other reduction, he'll still keep losing it. So nobody has an incentive to deviate. Okay, so if they increase, they'll either get no additional utility or they stay at zero. So all these strategies, oh sorry, this strategy that is B1 equals to 10, B2 equals to 20, B3 equals to 30, and B4 equals to 40 is also a Nash equal. So second price seal bid is the most interesting because theoretically you can establish that everybody bidding their price is a Nash equilibrium, yet there are other Nash equilibria possible. Okay, so other Nash equilibria are possible. So so suppose the bid amounts are, let me ask you an example, suppose the bid amounts are 10, Sorry, the valuations are 10, 20, 30, and 40. Okay. So which of these is a possible Nash equilibrium? Okay, 10, 20, 30, 35. B, 30, 30, 30. 30. Okay. When people have the same pair, if n people on V1, then anyone can get it with 1 by n 
probably. So if three people are tied on the highest valuation with one by three, anybody can get it. C is 10, 10, 10, 10. And D is 35, 45, 55. No, sorry. Uh, 31, 32, 34, 36. So which of these multiple could be correct? Which of these are Nash equilibria? Remember, all you have to check is no incentive to deviate, nothing else. None of the agents should have an incentive to deviate. So once you give an answer, I'll also ask like which agents have an incentive to deviate. So think about it correctly. A and C are Nash equilibrium. Okay. So one answer is A, C. Sir, A. Only A? Yes, sir. Sir, A. Okay. So, who has an incentive to deviate in B? Since all of you are saying B is not an Ash equilibrium, who has an incentive to deviate here? Sir, so, A, are one, two, first and second agents have an incentive to deviate. Very good, very good. First and second. Because right now, with some probability, with one by four probability, anybody can get it. And the price is going to be equal to 30. So, if, that, if this guy has to buy it at 30, right? If this guy has to buy it at 30, then uh, he gets a negative utility. So it's better for him to reduce his bid, stop being a winner. So this case is not an Ash equilibrium, correct? Uh, so two of you are saying C is not an Ash. So who has an incentive to deviate here? I don't think there is an incentive to do that. Yeah, so the others who have answered that C is an Ash equilibrium, can you please tell me who has an incentive to do that? Okay, here, what is the Value, what is the price? 
10 10 price is 10 okay so with 1 by 4 probability each of them wins so suppose agent 1 wins so when 1 wins with 1 by 4 probability his utility is going to be zero because his valuation is 10 he pays the price 10 if 2 wins his utility is 10 if 3 wins his utility is 20 and if 4 wins his utility is 30. If they lose the utility is 0 and each of these 4 people win with probability 1 by 4. So expected utility of 1 is 0. Expected utility of 2 is 10 by 4 which is 2.5. Expected utility of 2 is 20 by 4, which is 5. And expected utility of 4 is 30 by 4, so that is 7.5. Now, suppose agent 4 bids 11 rupees. What will be the price? Suppose this is the only change which happens. And what will be the price? It will remain there. But now agent 1 wills with certainty. Okay. So when price price is 10, utility of agent 4 is 30 with certainty, which means that expected utility of 4 becomes equals to 30 into probability, which is 1. So he can increase his expected utility by going slightly up. So four has an incentive to deviate. Three also has an incentive to deviate. Two also has an incentive to deviate. Only one will not have an incentive to deviate. Is it clear? Yes, sir. Others also, I don't know if you found it out or not, but all three of them have an incentive to Okay, so you should be clear with this. Okay, so you all of you have also said D is not an Ash equilibrium. So who has an incentive to deviate at D? Yuvakshi. First. First, okay. okay First and second agents. So what is the price right now? So and even part. Huh? 30? 1, 2, 3, both the agents have an incentive. All right. What is the price right now? 34. Price is 34. Okay. What is the utility of agent 1? Minus 3. Why minus 3? Who is winning the bid? Okay. No. Utility will be 0. 0. Right. So what kind of deviation do you think he can make? To increase his utility. No deviation. So one has no incentive to deviate, right? Yeah. Same with this guy? Yes. Yeah. And same with this guy. Because the only possible deviation, so these people are losing. If they reduce, they'll keep losing. Nothing changes. The only way they, something changes is they bid higher. Now, if they have to bid higher, they have to go above 36. And then the price becomes 36. Now, if price becomes 36, then all these three agents who have valuation less than 30, less than equals to 30, will get negative utility. Right, so so that's why these people have no incentive to deviate. And coming to fourth agent, he now pays a price of thirty-four. If he increases, he'll keep winning, keep paying thirty-four. If he reduces by more than two, there's a chance that he might lose. So he'll get zero utility. So he's getting a positive utility. He's getting a utility. What is the utility that he's getting right now? By the way. What is utility of agent 4 here? Think about it. Don't jump to answers. Remember, 
for all of you. Utility is valuation minus price. So, so what is the utility? Okay. Ruakshi, what is the utility of agent four? Sir, six. Very good. Six. Six is the correct answer. It's not bid minus price. It's valuation minus price. So you have to subtract the price from the original valuation. Original valuation is 40 minus price 34. So that is 60. So that's the utility. Anyway, so what I'm saying is he's getting a positive plus six utility. If he reduces it to, if he reduces his bid to less than 34, he gets a zero utility. Okay. Uh, so that wraps this up. Uh, okay. All right. Uh, we should be doing some readings. So let's come to variant. So there's this auction chapter, chapter number 17. So You can go through this, these readings, reservation price, what's the reservation price? Uh, you'll also come to know about other names, like Vickery auctions. What are Vickery auctions? What's the reservation price? Position auctions. And then there's a bit of math. Most of it is just uh, uh, verbal. You can skip mechanism design and these things. You can skip the last two sections. Okay, 17.7 and 17.8 you can skip. Okay, still 17.6 you can do. Okay, that's 17.6. So read 17th chapter till 17.6 and uh, okay, not this. I'll I'll share chapter 17 problems if I find them to be interesting. I have not already uploaded them. I think they are not so interesting. That's why I have not uploaded it. But uh, I'll see if they are interesting with respect to uh, auctions. Because it's a completely different chapter. Uh, 